Hello, and you're very welcome to episode 17 of The Fifth Court, a podcast on legal affairs presented by myself, Peter Leonard Barrister. And myself, Mark Tottenham Barrister and editor of Decisis.ie. Mark, good to see you as always. And uh, before we get any further, we need to give a little shout out to our sponsor. This, of course, is Practice Evolve Software, combining document management and accounting software, offering law firms a holistic practice management solution built with lawyers in mind. Well, last week, you will recall, we had a fascinating interview with Dr. Neil Maddox of Maynooth University, who talked to us about vaccination and the law. It was kind of quite a philosophical discussion, really, wasn't it, Mark? Yeah, it was, uh, absolutely. And went went into a lot of different issues concerning... Civil liberties, civil liberties. The the famous fluoride case. Yes, of course. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. County Limerick, wasn't it? Was I right about that? yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, on today's show, we're going to discuss the changing world of copyright law, particularly in the world of music with barrister and colleague Stephen Hanafy, who has written extensively on this subject. He'll be focusing on the recent Ed Sheeran case, but he's told me, Mark, he's also going to give a mention to your favourite singer, Michael Bolton. I think he's your (laughs) favourite singer singer, as far as I remember. I think he is. Well, before we get into such wonderful philosophical questions, uh, let's talk about some of the cases, brilliant cases that you've identified from the Decisis website. First, we're going to start with an application for an environmental damage-related injunction. This is the case of North Westmead Turbine Action Group, CLG, versus Westland Horticulture Limited. It's a decision of Ms. Justice Marguerite Bulger. Now, this concerned attempts to carry out, carry out winterization. You very kindly explained to me what that was. Uh, this is winterization works on bog land upon which was situated a wind farm. Uh, and uh, the defendant in this case had proceeded with carrying out these works, but they were unauthorised. But then there was a twist in the case as well. Mark, tell yeah. us more. So the, the so as you said, this is a bog land where there had been a, a wind farm, and they wanted to carry out these the, these winterisation works, which effectively is sort of d- digging channels in order that that that, that there, there isn't too much silting up of the the bog land. Um, A previous application had been made to the local authority under what's called Section 5 of the Planning and Development Act, which is where the local authority determines whether these works are exempted development or not. And it was held in that that instance that they were not exempted development or they did constitute development, more importantly. However, they proceeded with the works on the basis they needed to be done before the winter. That's my understanding. And then this Northwest Meads Turbine Action Group then brought a what's called a planning injunction, which is open to anybody to bring an application to the court for an injunction where somebody's carrying out unauthorized development. Now, Ms. Justice Bulger in this case was satisfied that it was unauthorized development. However, she said um, that the courts, obviously, in relation to any injunction, are, uh, have a discretion as to whether or not to grant an injunction. And she was satisfied that this work was necessary for winterization purposes, so she didn't grant the injunction. Okay, because she felt environmentally it was necessary to complete the work. Exactly, Is that it? Yeah, yeah. Okay, very interesting. Even though they were Curious, even though it was unauthorized development, and obviously there are other penalties available to the local authority if there is unauthorized development. But yes. in relation to the specific issue of the injunction, this the, the important thing was That's that very she was interesting. able to refuse. Yeah, very, very interesting. Okay, next to the well-known sports star Conor McGregor. The king of trash talking, Mark. This is a defamation case that came before Mr. Justice Simons. The case is called Lobov uh, versus McGregor, and it refers to Artem Lobov, I believe, who was the subject of some negative commentary by way of tweet by Mr. McGregor. He had referred to Mr. Lobov as a rat in many colourful forms. There was many twists and variations on the theme, I think. Uh, however, Mr. Justice Simon stated that this was abusive and vulgar language, but it didn't constitute defamation. Yeah, this is a, 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 again, this is an injunction application. He was seeking to restrain Mr. McGregor, Mr. McGregor from tweeting about him. Um, there, there is much language used in this judgment that unfortunately, while, while it might I'll be possible to use the judgment... Uh, Say it. Well, the, 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 Publish the, the, one, the ones that can be said, he just, uh, he seems to have described the plaintiff as an uncooked sausage 
a little blouse, a little Johnny head. And I'm not going to read out the rest, Peter, <laughs> although you may if you like to. He also, in one tweet, said, Artem is a rat, na 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 na, hey hey, na 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 na, hey hey, rat. Um, so the, the, it g- gives you a flavour of, of the tweets in question here. The important thing, however, was that the, the, the description of rat was considered not yes, by Mr. Justice that was the argument that was made to be by, defamatory. By Mr. Lobov, wasn't and, it? And, and I mean, the curious thing here is I think one, one of the cases we all learn about is the case of, of Barry, where he was described in a photograph as a 20th, 20th century, century felon, felon setter, setter. which I suppose Peter is Barry. another way of using the term rat. Secretary of the Department some, of Justice. Exactly. Yes. And, and in that case, it was held, well, if, if you are co- cooperating with the authorities, how can, you, how can it possibly be defamation? So right-thinking um, people so will not think less of you if you are deemed that, to be that, assisting the authorities. That okay, appears wow. to be the case. But anyway, in, in this the case, uh, as you say, Mr. Justice Simons described this as vulgar abuse, but not defamation. Can I, can I read out a quote that I got from your website? Uh, and this is Mr. Justice Simons. He says, the hypothetical reasonable reader reading these tweets, I suppose, referring to the rat, etc., uh, would not understand them to have meanings contended for by the plaintiff. It is more likely that they would be regarded as no more than a rant, a tirade of vulgar abuse by an MMA fighter with a reputation for trash talking. Can't argue with that. <laughs> okay. Finally, Mark, let's take a look at the Enoch Burke case. Now, the world and his mother knows about the Enoch Burke case, but it was published and that's, what, that's how Indeed, we yeah. get our, our decisions from. Um, and this was a decision of Mr. Justice O'Moore, uh, Brian O'Moore, uh, and he released Mr. Burke from prison, uh, who had been placed incarcerated, exactly. I suppose, because he was in breach of a contempt order. Uh, Events have kind of moved on since, mm. but this decision is very significant. Do you want to give me your well, take well, on it? Well, this decision was from the 21st of December 2022. So as you say, time has moved on. But what happened was Mr. Burke, who was the subject of disciplinary proceedings within the school, the school had got an injunction re- uh, requiring him, restraining him from attending the school premises. And he insisted on continuing to attend. And therefore, the, the court had um, incarcerated him for contempt of court. That, that, that's a prov- Preventive detention, essentially, it's not it's not criminal detention. Yes, um, which is an important distinction to make. Um, once it came to the Christmas holidays, of course, then the question rose as to whether he should be left in 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 um, in prison. And Mr. Justice so more effectively said that well, the, the the state is spending a lot of money on keeping him um, in prison at a time when there's no reason effectively for him to attend at the school premises because there's nobody there to teach. So so he was released. Uh, on the on the basis that 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 there was no public interest in re- keeping him in in detention. Yes, and I mean, Mr. Burke would try and spin this as a freedom of conscience thing that you know he was being incarcerated for his religious beliefs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. No, it's not the case. He was turning up at school when he was told by the High Court not to do that. That, 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 that certainly is the legal issue involved. I mean, he obviously wants to raise certain issues of his own con- concerning um, his religious or, or or fundamental beliefs. Can, but, can I can I refer to a, a quotation? Again? again, from Mr. Mm. Justice O'Moore, it says, It is difficult to avoid the conclusion that Mr. Burke is exploiting his imprisonment for his own ends. This would explain why he took such an unreal view of the orders uh, of this court involved. It would explain why he resisted an early trial, which could have seen him free now, are on the cusp of freedom. It would explain why, after over 100 days in prison, he rejected the proposal of Dignam J, that's Conor Dignam, a High Court judge, that could have led to his immediate release. Yeah, and the interesting thing here is that now the school is seeking to sequester certain funds belonging to Mr Burke, which is one of the other tools available, at least in theory, in relation to contempt of court, but is very, very rarely used. So I think we'll be coming back to this case. Yes, I think we will be coming back to this case. Okay, back shortly with Stephen Hanafi Barrister. Discover Practice Evolve, your leading global technology provider of legal practice management, including case management, document management and legal accounting solutions. We are dedicated to constantly evolving our software and all our solutions are offered in the cloud. We connect software to improve productivity, while our focus on software competency ensures users are empowered to discover innovative ways of working. We call it software with a service. With Practice Evolve, law firms are more efficient, more profitable and knowledgeable. Discover more today at www.practiceevolve.com. Silence in the fifth court. 
OK, it is my great pleasure to welcome to the studio a colleague, Stephen Hanafi, barrister. Uh, Stephen, thank you very much for coming in. It's a pleasure, Peter. Thanks very much. Yeah, no, great. And we're going to talk about copyright. You've written a very interesting article in relation to that and based on the Ed Sheeran case. So we're very contemporary. We're up to speed with the latest thing here. That's but, right. But we were just talking, one of, the, one of the little gags we have, just talking to you beforehand, is any time Latin pops up, you know, and we're always talking about Latin and people give out to us for using Latin. And I was just kind of, you know, I didn't realise you are a graduate in Latin. You have a degree in Latin from Trinity, is that correct? Yeah, yeah, I did the two subject moderatorship in history and Latin. And um, I loved it, I loved it. I don't want to bang on about it too much because my pals will... um, slag me tomorrow morning or okay. whenever this podcast comes out. But yeah, well, that's yeah, all right. I, I, I love it. It's quite my... impressive. That's why I had to mention it, you know. Yeah, yeah. It was my favourite subject in school and I said, I don't know what I want to do. You know, it might be law, it might be something else, it might be teaching, it might be academia. But I knew that, you know, Latin and history were a safe bet in order to enjoy college. But of course, I spent most of my time kicking a ball around aimlessly on college park. Yeah, well, you have to uh, do that as well. But you did very well. You got a first in Latin, didn't you? Uh, I did, I did. But Peter, please. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, enough, you're making me enough, blush. enough. And why, why didn't you go into, like, you know, guys with backgrounds like that become classicists and, yeah, they do, you yeah. know, and all that. Oh, so you, why time. the law? Where, where, how, how come you ended up going in the direction of the law then at that stage? Well, I was really lucky. After the Leaving Cert, um, as in um, just the summer, Immediately after leaving cert, I was um, fortunate enough to get a job in the Attorney General's office, working in the registry. Oh wow! Uh, which meant that I could talk to barristers, and uh, a lot of them were into stuff like sport and music, and they were all very nice and still are indeed. And as is our new Attorney General, of course. And um, I figured, you know, I like the kinds of stuff that these guys like, and uh, it seemed that it was within my um, abilities. Uh, so I said, yeah, maybe the law is the way to go. So I actually mentioned it to my old teacher in school, who's still around and still going strong and brought her the barra. And he put me on to um, a very distinguished commercial practitioner called Kieran Lewis. Yes, I'm okay. sure you know. we all know Kieran. yeah. We know and, Kieran um, well. Uh, he was mad enough to take me on as He didn't devil. bring you on the boat across the Atlantic, did he? Uh, he he almost did. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure he'll he'll try it again. But yeah, he he brought I me mean, on as his, as his yeah. devil. Sinbad the Seder. Wow, uh, yeah. un- unbelievable. Yeah, okay, so that was well, my course to the law. Yeah. Well, brilliant, brilliant, and what what a lovely way in into the law. Okay, so uh, we asked you to come in specifically because you wrote a very interesting uh, article in the Commercial Law Practitioner, mm. and this was about copyright and the changes in copyright, and you know all this streaming and all that sort of stuff has changed everything. Yeah, uh, and there's also been a number of high profile cases and Ed Sheeran case being being probably the most high profile of them all. I love the title of your article, Under Pressure, Copyright Protection in a Changing Music Injury, or Industry, sorry, I beg your pardon. Uh, obviously under pressure, it has uh, musical connotations. It does, yeah. The, the reference, of course, is to the, uh, the claim that was to be brought by David Bowie and Queen against Vanilla Ice. Um, you know, your, your, your favourite. Ice, um, ice baby, absolutely. 90s, yeah. Peter, uh, Robert Van Winkle. <laughs> and uh, in anticipation of that litigation um, arising from his own very famous and successful song from the, from the 90s, uh, which definitely sampled David uh, Bowie and Queen's Under Pressure, uh, he actually bought the rights uh, for that song. So he actually owns the rights to Under Pressure because it was one very um, neat way, albeit expensive way, to protect himself from litigation that was threatened against him by David Bowie and Queen. So um, I don't mention the article, but I, there are so many of these cases. Yes. I mean, I could say to you, what what do Led Zeppelin, Ariana Grande and Vanilla Ice have in common? Yes, they're musicians, but they've also been the subject of litigation in uh, copyright infringement. Is it happening more and more at the moment? Well, that's the whole idea behind the article. And sorry, I should have uh, corrected you earlier on, Peter. It's um, Stephen Hanfi and Fiacre Tracy, who yes. is a, sorry, a very you, you good friend a, of mine. Um, you have a co-author, yes. Yeah, yeah. so uh, Fiacre is um, a musician and very capable criminal practitioner who has been uh, um, kind enough to do a bit of deviling for me on the civil side this year. And because of his interest in music, uh, proficiency in the stuff, and the fact that he was interested in intellectual property in Trinity College, where I also went. I said, well, um, this could be a good opportunity for us to uh, pay homage to his experience and to my own experience in Trinity, where I was also interested in intellectual property. Lovely combo. Okay, let's talk about the Ed Sheeran case. Yeah. Is there anything new under the sun? in terms of music. I mean, there's so many combos of notes yeah. and words and lyrics and flats and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. But, you know, is there not just going to be overlap all the time in music? 
Is, is that not the issue? Or go on, well, t- well, talk to there, us about Ed Sheeran is, anyway is a, and why yeah. he was deemed to have, well, he, he was successful in the case ultimately, yeah. but there was some issue as to whether he had, you know, he wasn't the originator of the, the piece of music. You know, it's there's so much in this really, Peter, when you asked me to come on the show, I said I'd better reread my article, obviously, but I found more interesting stuff that should have and maybe could have gone into the article, but... Um, for reasons of space, well, I, you can I share I, those with us now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I was just down in Brown Thomas earlier on, and I could hear uh, the wonderful English singer Self Esteem song "Forever You." And then I came up to the fifth floor, and I heard a Moldovan song called "Pentru Cha," which I was able to find on Shazam. And I was struck by the similarity between the two songs: an English song and a Moldovan song. I mean, I'm no expert in music, but wow. but they uh, that's a know, fairly extensive. They, they were uh, very <laughs> very similar, and I said to myself, "This is gas." On the evening that I'm talking to you about songs that are similar, I hear two that are very similar from one floor of uh, this um, this area to another. Um, so there's there's loads in it, but the Sheeran case is the anchor of the article. I was struck by the um, precision of Justice Zaccaroli's uh, rational, rationalisation um, of the decision. I was struck by the detail based on the um, expert reports that was contained in his judgment. Um, in fact, uh, just reading about the case online recently, I noted that there was a suggestion by Ed Sheeran and his co-plaintiffs that the judge visit the studio and look at the computers that were used in the production of the songs and um, that formed the Divide album. And the judge apparently said, as fascinating as that, that might be, it uh, probably won't be necessary. Yes. Um, okay. But it's interesting that Dennis MacDonald, our own justice of the High Court, visited Bewley's recently to look at the Harry Clark windows to see whether they could be removed as was alleged by the uh, tenant of the Ronan Group, okay. um, who are the subject of um, a decision. That's so we're talking about field trips for judges here. Field trips we? for judges. I mean, that's interesting. That's what I think that's, that should appeal uh, in terms of subject matter to your uh, law student listeners, okay. I think. I okay. always found that interesting. Well, let's focus on the Ed Sheeran case. The song is The Shape of You, very well-known hit. I'm not really in tune with, with, with yeah. popular music as much as I used to be. Five but I know that one. So that's a huge record. And, uh, and what was the issue then? Well, the issue was uh, that um, Mr. Shockery, the defendant in the action, had uh, contacted the Performing Rights Society, which is basically analogous to our own uh, phonographic performance, Ireland, which is an entity that you know vindicates performers' rights. And they had written to the PRS in England, asking the PRS to suspend all royalties being paid to Ed Sheeran and his co-songwriters because of uh, their suspicion that there had been illicit copying of Sammy Shockery's 2015 song, Oh Why. Um, it's, it's worth listening to the song on YouTube, YouTube if only for context. Yes. It's, it's, I don't think it's a very nice song. It's not good. It's certainly not as good as Mr. Sheeran's. But there is a part of it that goes, Oh Why, Oh Why, Oh Why. And he claimed that that was um, so similar to a phrase or a hook in Mr. Sheeran's song, Oh I, Oh I, Oh I as to give rise to copyright infringement. And uh, so the suspension of the royalties that ought to have gone to Ed Sheeran and his co-songwriters uh, prompted Ed Sheeran himself and his co-songwriters pr- to bring a claim to vindicate their position and to seek so declarations. So it was their, their litigation. They brought Sheeran, the case. of course, is the plaintiff, yes. Sheeran's mm-hmm. the plaintiff. He was obviously displeased with the suspension of the royalties, which actually amounted to 2.2 million by the time of the decision by uh, the court. So, um, enraged by that, obviously, he brought an application for declarations and was successful. Uh, So, in other words, he managed to persuade the court that on uh, the suggestion of conscious copying and subconscious copying, the defendant's case against um, Mr. Sheeran, which was brought by way of a counterclaim in the proceedings, was uh, was not was not a good one. Um, So, uh, and that distinction between conscious and subconscious yeah, copying is an important that to, one. Would you explain yeah. that to our listeners, please, Stephen? Yeah, that's so, that's I mean, very interesting. Mr. Justice Zaccaroli sets it out very clearly in the first couple of pages of his decision. Um, and I think it's important to note that there is a distinction between the evolution of this area of law in England and by extension Ireland on the one hand and on the other hand in the United States of America. Because in England, uh, when you talk about conscious copying, the proofs that are required of the plaintiff there are to show that there was substantial similarity between, say, song A and song B, and also that there was proof of access. In other words, that the alleged infringer actually accessed the music. Now, Mr. Justice Zaccaroli is at pains to point out that it's 
proof of access and not proof of possibility of access. Will you explain that a little bit closer, a, 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 bit, yeah. a little bit more for me? Please. Yeah, so every day... Pro- proof of access, what does that mean? Uh, in other words, the plaintiff must show, in the case of conscious copying, that the infringer actually accessed the music. Listen to it. Okay. And that, how, how on earth do you prove that? Uh, by evidence. By evidence. And in this case, Mr. Shockley had sent a copy, a demo, mm to Mr. Sheeran's handlers mm. and had asked him to listen to it. But as Peter said, I mean, there, there, there are millions of songs around the world and now pretty much any song of any well, this interest is where, whatsoever is available effectively for free on the internet. Yeah, this so is to prove that somebody heard some little known song from, say, Australia and and based their, their yeah. massive hit in the States or the, the UK on it. I mean, how would you, how could you prove that? Well, First of all, Mr. Justice Acaroli said it's proof of access and not proof of possibility of access. In other words, there are thousands of song upload, so songs uploaded every day to Spotify and what have you. And um, that being the case, uh, it's not enough for a defendant to say that it was possible for someone to YouTube a particular song and to pluck from that the piece that we say gives rise to copyright infringement. Um, that would be too easy for the plaintiff. You need to show, in fact, that it has been accessed. And if you read the decision, which I'm sure you have, you'll see that the the judge went through all evidence available to it, voice notes, um, MP3 files saved to the computer systems at the time, um, New York Times documentary that was made about the production of the Divide album, uh, and also a film that was uh, made subsequent to the production of the album that featured Mr. Sheeran talking about a songwriting process. The judge teased out all of these facts and determined that no, Mr. Sheeran had not accessed the song song or on the balance of probability. Now, where it gets really interesting is where you contrast the American experience from the UK experience. Conscious co- uh, copying and uh, subconscious copying are basically where... The, the, the default line arises. So in um, the UK and in America, in the case of conscious copying, the proofs are the same. It's substantial similarity between the two songs and the fact that you access the song. In subconscious copying, what you need to do if you're a plaintiff in England, say, is to show that the infringer was familiar with the piece of music and that there was a causal link between the two. In other words, that but for the first song... So there has to be a causal a link. A causal link. And it's and the that, subconscious thing, though, I would have thought that meant that it just happens to be the same. Yeah. And therefore, there's an assumption that you're on a bus somewhere and you heard the music and it seeped into your brain yeah. and you've effect- effectively replicated what somebody else has done. That's what I would have thought subconscious meant. But yeah. you're telling me something different. Yeah, there must be, uh, in accordance with the English jurisprudence, which we should assume would be followed uh, here, unless there was a decision that suggested otherwise, um, you need to show that there was um, a causative link or a causal link between the two pieces of music. But that element, that requirement is not applicable in America. So it's easier for plaintiffs in America than it is uh, for those in England, say. In America, all you need to show is that um, there's a substantial similarity between the two songs and that there was what's called reasonable access. In other words, it was reasonably possible for the infringer to access the song. And this is where Michael Bolton fell down. Uh, which we can come to if you like. Please, Mark. Mark, Mark I know you're a, a fan. <laughs> he has all his albums. He has all his albums. Of um, <laughs> I, um, I, I was going to go back. How can and we now I can't remember. I, happy now, friends. Now, now, now I've been so, so, so uh, <laughs> shockingly defamed in my own podcast. There's <laughs> no shame. In it, Mark. There's no shame. Um, it, it is a strange one and it struck me as unusual. Um, but it's not only mentioned in Zaccaroli's deci- Justice Zaccaroli's decision, it's also mentioned in the Mitchell and B. BBC case, which is cited towards the end of the article. And uh, the judge in that case says that the causal link is required to be proven uh, in England. And also, they say, uh, American jurisprudence doesn't apply in the English experience. And so, just to give the example of Michael Bolton, uh, it seems um, in that case uh, that it was uh, shown um, on the balance of probability that as a young man, he had listened to the Eilly Brothers song, uh, in the R&B genre. Back in the 60s. Wasn't back in the 60s, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It made something like 110 in the Billboard charts. And uh, somewhat unfairly from Mr. Bolton's point of view, uh, it was held that that constituted reasonable access. Um, so even though he published his song some 25 years later, 
uh, from that point. It was lingering. It was it was lingering it was in his in subconscious. Yeah, yeah. Okay. and so it's it seems on its face unfair, and there has been criticism. I mean, even yesterday I saw a recent um, academic piece written on the unfairness from defendant uh, artist point of view to uh, litigation brought against them in the United States. It's simply easier. And in fact, one academic raises the question as to whether these cases should be left in the hands of juries who this particular academic deems to be uh, musicologically inferior to particular judges who are trained in the area. Now, that's a controversial point. Yes. But put it this way, if you're sued in England, you're on better ground than you are in New York State. Okay, and and nobody is untouchable here. Uh, the great George Harrison of the Fab Four, he That's the most became, famous case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My Sweet Lord, his famous song, uh, which was kind of a religious piece of music, wasn't it? It, it was, yeah. And um, it was alleged successfully to have been uh, taken from, illicitly that is, a song by Ronald Mack, He's So Fine. And that really is the, the fonz at origo of a lot of these copyright decisions. It's... Um, I suppose, the most famous uh, case in this area to the layman. Um, and it's uh, it's cited in all of the decisions, um, uh, including in this one by uh, Mr. Justice Zaccaroli. And when you say that the Irish law can be assumed to be pretty much similar to the English law here, is there is there, is there European legislation in relation to copyright or are we still effectively sort of w- working on a common law basis? Well, there are two elements to that. It, w- one is that... Um, there's not a whole lot of Irish case law on the subject of music copyright. Sure. Um, I mean, there have been some cases brought in the kind of literary sphere. Uh, but in relation to European law, there was a directive that gave rise to amending legislation in 2013 here, which push, pushes out by 20 years the period of copyright. Uh, originally in the... It's more to do with the period of copyright the period, than the yeah, actual it's infringement from, issue. Yeah, it's gone from 50 to 70. But no, I don't understand there to be any substantive changes to the law underpinning infringement. Um, the the opening quotation in my article is kind of uh, hanging there. You'll see that it's taken from an EC directive, but it's from 2001. And the reason that Fiacre and I saw fit to include it at the beginning of the piece is because as early as 2001, um, uh, the drafters of European legislation were conscious of the need to bring the law up to date with um, new vectors for technological advancement, uh, as it says there. Uh, they needed to keep up with um, changes in um, technology. Um, and of course, even now, we have new phones that allow us to capture music via Shazam, say, immediately, and with other technology to splice that music and to create our own pieces, potentially in breach of other people's copyright. Wow. There, there has also been the tendency, hasn't there, by it, to extend periods of copyright to the huge benefit of companies like Disney that ha- they're able to sort of further exploit rights for yeah. 20 years after they might otherwise have been able to. Did you see the piece in The Economist in December? There was an essay about that very subject. I it, missed that particular. Yeah, it I seems like Mickey Mouse studio. is coming out of Tell copyright. us all about it. Yeah. Oh, Mickey Mouse, of course. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, if you, if, you, if you watch, if you pick out any Disney film on Netflix nowadays, You'll be struck by the initial phase of the film, which is Stoneboat Mickey, the original Mickey, not wearing gloves in a grainy black and white Mm -hmm. um, tugboat or steamboat um, uh, piece of footage. And uh, academics and lawyers in the States uh, suspect that the reason Disney are showing that version of Mickey is to establish Mickey as a trademark. And in trademark uh, law, there is no um, temporal period at which your uh, rights end, unlike in copyright. So it seems that um, uh, Disney are getting their retaliation in early and establishing Mickey as not just a a creature of copyright, um, but rather a trademark. So there's some interesting stuff happening now. So Disney um, have Mickey Mouse. Uh, The DC world has Batman and the Batmobile, believe it or not, which will come out of copyright in coming years. So it's a, it's a really interesting but space, this. And that's outside so there's a lot of music. Of, there's a lot of crossover as a result of this Sheeran decision. Or is there crossover? It, has it implications for, for pieces of writing? Has it in implications for movies? Are, are you seeing kind of broader implications, Stephen? Um, only insofar as the judgment itself... Uh, vindicates the ability of the courts to uh, in turn vindicate the rights of artists and music artists in particular. So, I mean, I, th- the the genesis of this article was not just the uh, song um, case uh, yes. involving Sheeran and, and Shokri. Uh, it was also a coffee that Fiacre and I had last year in Ranla, where uh, as a musician, Fiacre told me of his concern and other um, original 
uh, writers' concerns that their music was not getting a fair listen on Spotify and the likes and that there was a potential that their music would be listened to and sampled unfairly or illicitly by other artists. And uh, so that was the beginning of the, the writing process. And so uh, to the extent that this decision will have an effect on um, the music world, it should be a positive effect from the point of view of artists because it shows a judge attuned to the realities of the writing process. I mean, the man was able to weigh the evidence of the expert witnesses, um, in my estimation, to a perfect degree, to the point where the judgment was unassailable. So he made a decision based on the facts, which was uh, very sound and very, very carefully pleaded. I mean, I, I reread the thing yesterday and still I don't understand some of the musicological references. I'm not a musician myself. Yes. Um, but even, even uh, I'm sure... So it was a very extensive analysis. Now, Stephen, yeah, was, this, is, yeah. this is fantastic. Is there anything in Irish law? Have we anything in Irish jurisprudence in that's that's equivalent? Well, some Nothing people go back say, to Count John McCormick or anything like that, no? You can go back further further than Mr McCormick. You can oh, go really? back to Brehan Law, in fact. It's, it's, it's <laughs> said... It's like Count Kill, of course. Yeah, <laughs> it's said that he had infringed the uh, copyright, if you can call it that, of St Finian. Mm. in copying from a particular Psalter. You knew about that, Mark? Yeah, to every cow it's calf, to every book it's copy, isn't that it? Yes, that's the one. Wow, that's the one. This is an education for me. So, yeah, we Irish can claim copyright as our own, so you can Mm. forget about the Statute of Anne in 1710. Um, We gave rise rise to copyright law, so you can... You can stick on your green jersey, Peter. As God, I. you you learn something new every day. Wow, Stephen, this has been absolutely brilliant. Well, before we let you go, before we let you go, oh yeah, Desert yeah, you're, you're going to have to. Yes, you're going to have to tell us what you'll bring with you to the island. Um, <laughs> in terms of books, what what are you recommending? Just just on the island shout. And um, I know in Desert Island Discs, you're given the complete corpus of Shakespeare. Uh, measure for Measure is the most legalistic of his plays. So yes. that's, that's one that you crack open as a law student if you're a Shakespearean. Measure, more, more than The Merchant of Venice. Uh, more, yeah, it's, it's deemed to be more, uh, have to it has it. more copious references to the law and it has that lovely um, encouraging phrase, our doubts are traitors that make us lose the good we oft might win by fearing to attempt. And in which play does he say, let's kill all the lawyers? Um, that's uh, that's as you like, night's is it? A midsummer night's <laughs> dream. Okay, very I'm only, good. I'm only messing. But uh, in terms of my own books, the I Merchant would... of Venice is a better car chase, though I think. Hasn't yeah, it? yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Great explosions. Um, so, in terms of my own book, I would highly recommend to all lawyers and particular barristers, Advocates by David Panic. Now, Lord Panic, written in 1992, it's a treasure trove of anecdotes going back centuries about um, lawyers and their. Uh, the ways in which they employed rhetoric, including tears, including actions in court to persuade judges and juries. And I found it very, very interesting. But also as a defense of the cab rank rule, I think it's um, uh, very impressive and it's worth reading. Um, in fact, whenever I read it, I found that on every page I was learning something do, by does way of CPD. the cab, cab rank rule have to be defended? Mark, what do you think? You come in on this one? It, up to a point, Lord Copper. I think the, uh, <laughs> the, 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 the there are certainly arguments for it. Certainly, everybody is entitled to representation. But isn't I think it, isn't it's, that a fundamental? Hmm. Isn't it something yeah. that we should, I think, yeah, no, that's very, there is very a, good. There is a nobility to the principle. Yeah. And if you want to know why that is, read Panic. He puts it much sure. better than I could. Uh, a second book would be um, Shoe Dog, which was recommended to me by a very good friend of mine from England. And it's the uh, memoir by Phil Knight, who set up Nike. And I just thought to myself at the time that this is crucial reading for anyone setting up a business, be it big or small. He talks about the importance of being able to fix your own photocopier and just get on with dealing with banks and the revenue commissioners and all issues that can arise. And so I thought, well, Nike was this massive conglomerate that was always around. But in fact, its beginnings were fraught with difficulty and litigation. Uh, And uh, he is very forthright in his... um, Okay. Recollections Sounds of events, great. yeah. And what um, about a movie, Stephen? Have you got a movie for us? Well, there's only one uh, law movie that uh, I'd, I'd, um, I'd ever recommend. Uh, Intolerable Cruelty um, by um, the Coen brothers. It's, uh, it harks back to the screwball comedies of um, the golden Hollywood era. And it has George Clooney playing Miles Massey, the, of course, Irish family lawyer who comes into contact with Catherine Zeta-Jones's stunning um, uh, Rex Roth. Um, and she divorces Rex Roth and is end, ends up penniless and then strikes up a relationship with George Clooney. But uh, I would 
encourage all law students wow. to watch well, this. Well, I haven't seen it myself, so it sounds great. Yeah. He sold the prenup well. in that. The, the, the something it's a prenup. It's a massive prenup. prenup. Yeah, 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 the, yeah. the unbreakable prenup. Yeah, yeah, it's, wow. uh, yeah there's, there's no getting through a prenup. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, it's, Stephen, this, it's has excellent. Been, this has been a mine of information, I have to say. I've really enjoyed our discussion. I've enjoyed being mine. Great, great, <laughs> great. Well, thank you for coming in. So, Stephen Hanafi, thank you for being a guest on The Fifth Court. Thank you. Practice Evolve, your legal technology provider, here to provide our users software with a service. Incorporating cloud solutions, connected integrations, and encouraging user competency. The Fifth Court will adjourn until next week. So that's all from this edition of The Fifth Court. We hope you have enjoyed it. Can we say a huge thank you to our guest, Barrister Stephen Hanafy, for coming in and telling us all about recent changes in the copyright laws. Really interesting, Mark. Very. Yeah. No, really good. Uh, and I'd also like to say a huge thank you to our producer, Cunnell O'Moroyne, and to the Dublin South podcasts, and in particular, Mr. Peter Rice, who does a brilliant job for us recording this show. Uh, and Mark, what about our sponsor? Yeah, we'd like to thank very much uh, Practice Evolve Software, which combines document management and accounting software and offers law firms a holistic practice management solution built with lawyers in mind. Good, 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 good. If you have any comments or any legal stories you would like to raise with us, please contact us on our website and on LinkedIn. Uh, And please share this podcast because we're still building up an audience. Uh, So for me, Peter Leonard. And myself, Mark Tottenham. Thank you for listening and we'll see you soon in the Fifth Court. (laughs) 